Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today to this uh, first uh, open lecture we have uh, during our course in Smart Microscopy. Today uh, we have uh, Alexander Halatabi. Sorry, I think uh, probably I need to try. I need to 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 meet you more, and you will introduce me better in your family name. Uh, he's joining us all the way from the EMBL in Heidelberg, and he is actually working in the advanced line microscopy facility with our colleagues uh, in Heidelberg at the EMBL. And today he's going to discuss, of course, as the course go on the um, uh, smart microscopy and automation, he is going to show us what they what is the way that they actually do or uh, automate uh, some of the microscopes. I heard to, today that you have several of them already in that way. That would be great to maybe get you again and as, as with the tools that uh, probably any of us could use, at least the Fiji tools uh, will be the automic tools is something that I really would like to hear more. And I would like to do, and this is more logistics, please all the questions, uh, remember to put in the QA, please, please do it on the QA and not in the chat, that we can say that QA and in case that we don't have today time to answer all your questions or your hot questions, uh, we will send it to Alexander and he will be so grateful and answer. It's also recorded, he have allowed us to record this session that means that we can also make it available if he doesn't mind to everybody that is attending that for the moment is 88 people. Alexander, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, Julia, for a kind introduction. And thanks a lot, all organizers, for inviting me. As was, uh, as was already announced, on behalf of my colleagues at the Advanced Light Microscopy Facility at EMBL, I would like to share our experiences about doing adaptive feedback microscopy with uh, several confocal microscopes. And I want to essentially split my talk in two parts. First of all, I want to do several examples of applications which we are currently running. And of course, I cannot cover them all, but I will try to have uh, show more striking examples to show that we really can support broad variety of applications. And in the second my, part of my talk, I want to come to the technical details, how we try to make, to support all this variety applications in a consistent, in a consistent manner. I would be happy to hear all your questions at the end. So let's actually start with very basic example, right? It, in, it's by now almost a textbook example when we have a large field of view and we are interested in a particular phenotype. In this case, we have a cell culture, right? And this live cells, and we are interested to identify mitotic cells or cells in metaphase and actually image them at a high resolution. So we have to be very quick and we, we have to be very precise, right? Because if we want to image this, for example, on the point scanning and focal microscope, we want to also restrict the field of view as much as possible in order to make it as fast as possible also in 3D. So I, if I have to do it manually, I have to already spend some time in all order to find where these cells are, right? And then if we would do it manually, we will actually move the stage and need to zoom on uh, them, define the stack and we'll acquire. So at the end, we want to have results like that, but we want to have it without any time delay and at the same time to catch all the essential information. So what we can do, as you already know, most likely from the course, we can acquire the uh, overview image at a relatively low zoom, which allows us to identify these positions. And instead of processing this image manually, we can teach the microscope software to identify interesting objects and proceed with the high zoom imaging. So such that we are with the limited field of view, acquire multiple objects in a very short time and can repeat this process for multiple positions or multiple time points and so on and so forth. So let's consider this scheme in general, what we essentially want to do in many of our applications, we want to have such a fully automated loop. So this loop has to work completely with the user interference where microscope is able to move to the next position find the focus, then acquire low zoom image. Let's take in this case, again, example of the metaphase cells, 
then this image has to be transferred to the online image analysis procedure. It has to be commercial software, or it has it can be commercial software, or it can be any open source software like ImageJ, Cell Profiler, Elastic Nime, you name it. And the aim of this software will be to identify the interesting object or phenotype of interest, right? So in this case, it's again mitotic cell. And then the coordinates of identified objects have to be transferred back automatically to the microscope where we can run the high content imaging modality. It can be multicolors, 3D, it can be time lapse, it can be something more complicated like FRAT, FRAP, FCS, or any F techniques you can imagine. We might be interested to identify more than one object. It means all the high content experiments have to be done in all these objects. And then we can move to the next position and then repeat again the entire cycle with the autofocus. So that is nice, but what we can do except uh, just imaging mitotic cells, we can actually do quite a lot. First of all, as was already said, we can use this to image our phenotypes, right? So the second thing, what we can do, we can trace the moving objects. So it means we, rather than having the phenotypes which are fixed in the space, we can have an object which we're interested to image in high resolution. So at each overview image, we will identify the moving objects. And then we will actually use the feedback microscopy to image it at a high resolution at the same time frame. The feedback microscopy can be as well used for the correlative imaging where we will acquire at the, uh, where we want to correlate images uh, uh, with a bigger field of view on one microscope and like with a limited field of view, but much higher resolution on another microscope. This can refer to the correlation with the regular diffraction limited techniques to super resolution techniques or also to the AM. And last but not least, because I will have quite uh, some examples on that, we can also use it for FRAP or photo activation. So instead of high zoom imaging, uh, specific uh, phenotypes, we want to uh, uh, either bleach fluorescence and follow the kinetics or photo activate the ob uh, objects for the different purposes to, uh, to follow them later on. Let's consider a few more examples before we go to the technical details. So in this particular case and the project which was uh, recently finished and uh, recently published, we were having samples where we had the Drosophila embryos in multi-well plates. And the size of the well around one centimeter. So the goal of this project was to identify each individual embryo and image it at a high resolution. So what we were doing, we were imaging the wells at a low zoom magnification. We were starting automated procedures to uh, find and uh, filter the embryos according to certain features. And then we were switching the objective fully automatically in order to image the embryos at high resolutions and in multiple colors. So this is nice, and this is how it very often will look in the textbook. But when we actually do it practically, we had to introduce several feedback steps because it was in practice quite difficult from the low resolution image in one jump to, uh, to get uh, uh, from low resolution image in one jump to get to the final high resolution image. To make the workflow more robust, we actually split it to a several decision points. So on the step one, we actually use the reflection imaging to identify the cover slip and to have a robust focusing step. So this image was already processed in the feedback microscopy loop and the reflection of the cover slip was identified. Then as already explained, we were uh, doing the low zoom image uh, to identify the embryos, and that's where these embryos were segmented. But before acquiring the final high zoom image, what we did, we already, with the uh, high zoom objective, acquired image with the lower resolution, with the extended depth of the stack. It allowed us to perfectly center our stack on the center of the embryo in XYZ, and in addition to identify the rotation of the embryo. Because of that, we were not only transferring to the microscope the coordinates of our object, but also rotation. Because in the uh, uh, confocal point scanning microscope, we can define the rotation of the field of view and acquire the, the, the embryo such that the direction of the scanning corresponds to our rotation. By that, further minimize the field of view and the imaging time needed to acquire this image. 
Let's consider another uh, example, and this is about moving objects. So Jonas Hartmann, uh, who was previously in Gilmer Group, uh, made pretty nice work on testing zebrafish prim primordium across the tail. So I, if we play this movie over time, so we will see that the structure actually remains still in our field of view. However, in the physical space, it's moving. And it's just a field of view which was following the structure by which we could do this high resolution. And this high resolution imaging was done with the area scan technique in order to enable to track the individual cells in 3D. Uh, more recently with Andrea Imler, we also optimized the workflow where we can track individual cells in the, in the extracellular matrix and follow the change of their shape again by combining the feedback microscopy with area scan. But what if we go beyond imaging? And here I want to show uh, two more examples where we use the FRAP and uh, uh, photo activation in our workflow. Let's consider again the cell culture. And here we, upon knockdown of, of certain genes, we have the, the mixed phenotypes. So some of the cells have the compact Golgi, other cells have the fragmented Golgi phenotype. What we are interested to, we are interested to isolate only fragmented Golgi phenotype in order to sequence them further and in order to identify uh, perturbations on, uh, on, the, on, on, on the transcriptomic level. However, upon in a real, real experiment, in a well, you will have always the mixed culture. What we want to do in this case, we want to photoactivate the cells which have only fragmented Golgi phenotype. And then because if we photoactivate the cells, we can further on use uh, the fax sorting supported by our fax facility in order to isolate only the photo activated cells, which we were able to photo activate on the microscope by looking on their phenotypes. And then we can continue with, uh, with, with the sequencing and identify the information which we want to. In order to have sufficient number of cells, we obviously cannot do it manually. Therefore, we again build the feedback microscopy workflow where we identify the cells of interesting phenotype, they are getting activated, and then we proceed with the sequence. The last example which I want to show you relates to fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. So as uh, we know, the basic aim of photobleaching experiments to uh, bleach fluorescence and follow the, its recovery over time to understand the kinetics of certain objects. In this project, which I did during my postdoc, we were interested in the recovery of fluorescence on the small structures, which are called ER exit sites. If you do, you can do this experiment uh, manually, but this is very tedious work because you need to identify the interesting field of views and you need to zoom on that. You need to select structure of interest. You need to start the experiment. And then actually you need to collect recovery and quantify that. The problem is, by the time you find the field of view and interesting structures, the structure might move out of the region of interest because they're fully mobile. So you, when doing this experiment manually, you will do a lot of false attempts in order not being able to fit the right structure. Therefore, we aim to automate this experiment where we actually try to make this analysis fully automated and as fast as possible that the microscope can make all the decision uh, points from the low zone to the high zone. To give you an overview, the, the final experiment was looking like that. So just to, uh, to explain the scheme a little bit, on the, on the top row, we have the pictures representing what's happening on the microscope. And on the bottom row, we have pictures representing what's happening on the analysis side. So first microscope moves to the next position. And we again, we're able to focus on the cover slip. And we were automatically uh, getting the, uh, the overview image of the whole field of view. Next, the image analysis procedure was identifying as a target cell and the region where we need to focus. Further on, the coordinates of these regions were transferred back to the microscope, which was acquiring the high zoom stack with, with, to identify the structure of interest. This stack was transferred again to the image analysis procedure, which where we were identifying the structure of interest and immediately triggering the FRAP experiment. By running uh, such an experiment automatically overnight, we were able to collect several hundreds of recovery curves, which were allowed us not only measure the average rec rec recovery times of individual structures, but also 
plot the distributions of, of such parameters in order to understand the heterogeneity of our sample, which is the information which you will never achieve many of them. So I hope I showed you that by using the feedback microscopy, we can run quite a big variety of applications, but actually let's now talk about how to design uh, how to design them. So what we want to have, we want to have actually a robust set of tools where we want to design and debug workflows, workflows to perform experiments, but this is not the end of our, our analysis. We want to also to browse and analyze the data. And to browse and analyze the data, we also want to have all the information of our experiment to be in the consistent, in the consistent shape. And while when we are designing such a workflow, we have as several requirements which we put to such a workflow. We want to have image analysis fast and image analysis communicating to microscope being robust and communicating in, in a uh, relatively fast manner. What fast is depends on the uh, example or depends on, on our biological application. Sometimes fast is a few seconds. Sometimes we need to be in order of a fraction of a second. As I showed you with a multiple uh, example, sometimes we want multiple feedback steps in order to make multiple decision points across our complex experiments. Because uh, uh, researchers uh, always want to do something new, we want to have a possibility to expand workflows and not build them uh, from scratch. We want to, in order to analyze the data properly, we want to lock all our experimental and analysis info, and we want to manage unexpected events automatically. Because if a microscope runs automatically and something happens overnight, let's say an, any analysis error, it has to continue somehow, right? It has also know what to do in case something unexpected happens. Finally, we aim also to have our workflows reusable, and reusable means to reuse it for similar applications, or if possible, also reuse when you have to transfer the work workflow from one microscope to another. Let's actually consider how to achieve that. On the technical level, we can represent our feedback microscopy experiment with such a communication diagram. We have a microscope, our hardware, and we, uh, we have for the commercial a microscope is a microscope software. In case of uh, size microscope, it will be Zen software. But then in order to communicate to image analysis, either being it inbuilt or being it external, we need some kind of a common interface. So when microscope acquires image, we need to transfer this to image analysis. And then when something is identified, we can transfer the coordinates of the interesting objects and tell microscope software what, what to do. And we can actually follow two different strategies. And now there are more and more inbuilt image analysis and decision-making solutions, which are inbuilt already in the microscope software. The good thing is that we provided and it's easy to design simple workflows. But at least when we started to run all these projects, we experienced lacks of flexibility for image analysis. So we were limited in, in a possibility to, to design complex and multi-step workflows. And sometimes when you have a bug, so because it's not open source, it might some, uh, take some time to fix it. The alternative way is actually to run the image analysis in the uh, open source software. So we can have a full flexibility desired in order of decision making, and we can combine commercial uh, nowadays commercial uh, microscopes with the open so source tools, but in most of the applications we require coding. So what we actually decided to do, we decided to establish uh, a workflow where we can in a robust manner work with uh, the, the open source tools and adapt uh, uh, and adapt several applications. So let's consider an example where as a microscope, we have size LSM 900. In case of a microscope software, we, uh, microscope software in this case will be size and blue. As a common interface, we use a, an established macro, which uh, uses uh, Iron Python, basically size macro. And then we have image analysis, which is per performed in Fiji, but can also link to other image analysis tools. What happens? When then Blue stores the image file, it, it's transferred to, to our workflow. This uh, identifies us uh, the interesting objects. And via Iron Python interface, it actually shifts uh, the data to the microscope software. 
More simplistic, it looks like that. From the then blue, we save image files in a certain folder where Fiji will monitor. Fiji identifies these files, and actually, when it's analyzed, it will save a JSON file in this, in this folder, which is then monitored by our uh, microscript, and which then will do our, which, which will uh, uh, then run follow up acquisitions. The problem if you do each and single um, work, uh, project from scratch, each project will require unique combination of features, right? So therefore, it's very time and efficient to start to rebuild such a system from scratch. Therefore, we uh, developed uh, the feature library, which is called Altimic Tools. And that's the, the core features of it I want to represent on that sl slide. So the library itself is actually a framework which allows you to design the feedback microscopy experiments, both a simple ones and more complicated ones. So as I said, outside of the automic tools, we have the microscope software itself, for example, then blue and remote control interface, which in our case is then micro. And then inside automic tools, you have to define several modules, but we provide either already big list of modules from which you can choose, or you can actually build your own with a guideline. First module which you have to structure is called a job distributor. The job distributor will catch newly acquired image files and will actually decide which job it has to run on. So basically by just capturing your file and analyzing its name, it, the job distributor will shift the image file to one of the jobs. And we have already a big list of the predefined jobs for autofocus, for cell identification, for bleach region definition, but the design is open. It means one can write his own job or one can actually link other external image analysis softwares by the linkers which we aim to provide. For example, we can make a job which will actually transfer the image data to very sophisticated uh, classif uh, uh, classifier in Python, then get the data back, and then we'll keep the entire loop consistent for the data acquisition. So except doing all these jobs, because we, we will need to run different jobs on different files, we aim the, uh, live, uh, the plugin will store information in the experiment table, which is needed in order to track all the decisions made, where the Heism objects, interesting objects were identified or not, where any error happened during analysis and so on and so forth. And this experiment table can be read or it can be actually browsed with the plugin with the additional plugin which we provide in the library in order to identify and the experiment flow after the experiment is finished i will skip that and just uh, as a last example which i want to make this is an example of the browsing such a table right because in the table we save all the information about the Heism files and uh, about Lozum file uh, images and Heism images. And we save also the coordinates and regions of interest of the cell as identified or all of the objects identified. And the information which can be saved on this table, you can also fine tune depending on your application. By browsing such a table, I can already identify whether objects were uh, uh, identified and bleached correctly or not. And, uh, and track all the necessary information in order to improve my experiment for the next iteration. So with that, I want to come to my summary. So I want, I hope I convince you that uh, with our library, we can flexibly design simple and advanced feedback microscopy protocols. We can combine it indeed with a multiple commercial microscope platform. So we don't only have the uh, interface for the blue software, we have also the interfaces to the black software and also to, to, some other, uh, to some other companies. So please contact me if you want to have more information. So we support logging and interactive browsing of experiment flow information. As a future steps, we want to actually step towards the microscope in the more microscope independent workflows. When a certain workflow for certain application is established once and can be transferred without any further effort between different platforms and between even different commercial vendors. We want to improve our capabilities for the data browsing and visualization for such experiments based on the information we automatically save. And we, cons uh, we improve tools and documentation in order to have more examples such that people can use our library with 
without interfering with us. So by, by reusing the examples, adapting to your particular needs. With that, I want to thank all people who contributed to the project. Of course, the entire, uh, uh, the entire facility, uh, as well as Center of Light Image Analysis, run by Christian Tischer for, for the great support. We need to thank uh, other facilities and our workshops for doing all this correlative work possible. And of course, our users and collaborators, because they are great inspiration by bringing us all their problems and uh, application. I want to also thank all, all the companies and all the open source communities in order to provide valuable feedback for making all this work being possible. And I would like to thank you for the attention. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, great talk. And then we can slowly move with a few minutes that we have for the Q&A section. Um, so I will just help you out a little bit here, just listing them. So one of the first questions we had was regarding your method to find the sharpest focus in a set stack. So uh, what method do you use and perhaps uh, what is the, um, let's say, the, the metric for focus that you use when you look through the stack? So it's very different for different applications. And what we realized, we cannot use a unified matrix. And that's why what was one of the reasons, again, to have our to have our library to be fully customizable. In case of Drosophila embryos, for example, what we did, we sometimes fit ellipsoid, right, and find the center of ellipsoid. Sometimes it's simply good enough to find the maximum, uh, to apply the maximum sharpness filter on just get the maximum intensity. So it's not a unified method, but we rather aim to have it adaptable to the particular needs. Perfect, thank you. Um, then uh, we also had people interested in how do you debug your experiments, especially when you have uh, experiments that are with the live samples. Um, so what do you do in that case to help you during the debugging process? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. And uh, I think that has to be always considered. Because indeed, when you have a live experiment, you have uh, all the samples, and if your tools are not ready, they will simply age. So as a general guideline, what we suggest to have, we suggest to first have very simple workflow where you have autofocus routing of your choice and low zoom imaging. And on the first round of imaging, we just acquire low zoom images and save them. In order then to debug our experiment in the library, we have a procedure where we simulate this experiment, right? Where, where we fit these low zoom images one by one in the same way as they will be acquired by the microscope, right? If you communicate via files, you can imagine very simple way. You just copy images one by one to the target folder, already have Altamic tools running, right? And see what kind of analysis Altamic tools will do and what kind of comments it will provide back to the microscope. In such a way, not everything, but many aspects of such an experiment can be even uh, debugged offline, right? Because if we have our plugin for the plugin, which is built in Automic Tools Library ready for particular workflow, we can debug it by simulating experiments if we at least have uh, out of focus and low zoom images. Thank you. Uh, and then maybe two questions are a bit related. So we have people uh, wondering if you are working on or if you already have available integration with, for example, MicroManager or OMX uh, microscope software. So we are not, we don't have it available and we don't have, let's say, in the immediate plans. But if somebody is interested to implement that, because basically to have a linkage to another microscope, one has to implement one Java class, basically. And we have a number of the microscopes, but we run in the facility and we first implement the needs, what we need in the facility. So if somebody interested to collaborate, we will be happy to provide the details, how to adapt uh, it, and how to provide the linkage to another software, being it commercial software or being a micromanager. Of course, the software has, I mean, the only requirement software has to be able to communicate with other applications by API, right? And then, as I said, we will be happy to dis discuss how to implement it. Perfect. Uh, perhaps we can also add later on if you have any, any link to a place where people can reach out to you and tell you that they want to collaborate in a specific yeah. way. Uh, 
Um, and then uh, perhaps one uh, final question is regarding the error handling during a live experiment. Let's say that you have set up your automated acquisition uh, that should last, let's say, 12 hours. Um, do you have ways in which you communicate to the user if there is a mistake in between? Or for example, that uh, your sample, something strange is happening, so they receive perhaps a message or something like that. What, what type of ideas have you played with? Okay, so basically errors can happen on the microscope side and errors can happen on the analysis side. So for the errors which happen on the hardware side, it's actually we uh, try to define this error log on the microscope common interface on this level, right? On the remote control interface. Everything in terms of errors which can be tracked and catched in the analysis side, we actually log into error log file, at least. There's also a possibility to define some immediate response like sending messages and so on and so forth. But typically this is not what is required. What is required is basically to log this error, to be able to, to have a meaningful message. And actually by defining each concrete job, you can define how this error will be handled. So one has to be able to browse through these errors and one has, uh, has to also decide what should happen with the experiment itself if the error happens, right? We need to catch how many errors happens and default behavior, for example, will be skip whatever was happening in this position, just continue to the next default position with the next loathsome image or with the next time point, right? Because if just one error happened, which might be when you're just optimizing the workflow, you don't want to stop entire experiment, right? But you want to clearly log it. So with a clear message and with clear image on which it happened to try to reproduce it even afterwards. And then you define in the workflow a certain strategy, which is in most of our examples, as I said, just keep the high zoom image in this position, log the error and continue with the low zoom image. But that can be, there can be as well other strategies. Let's, let's give a chance as well as the panelists. There is anyone want to ask a question or answer? I see Sebastian was answer. You can talk Sebastian, you are. Um, I just, I just really like the comment about this. How do I debug those workflows? And from a lot of years of experience, it's exactly like the presenter said. You need to acquire your living samples in the first place to have some health data, and you need a way to simulate your microscopes. Otherwise, from my experience, you will have a really hard time, and it will get really expensive. Um, because that's the only way how to make it run, no matter what system you use. It's the same for Blue or whatever Olympus, Leica, Nikon system. This is an independent approach, but this is really the key to get this running. And it's exactly how we do it as well. Any other comment or question? Robert, you have anything? <laughs> nope. Robert had many more questions before than after. Yeah, yes. probably. <laughs> and then uh, I think that the the, the only thing that uh, I would I would like to do is afterwards uh, perhaps to uh, link the, the the best way in which people can reach you out if they want to collaborate and and, and build on top of the tools that you have already started. Uh, so from my side, I, I don't have any further questions. Alex, thanks a lot. I don't know, Julia, if you have any closing remarks. No, I just want to thank you, Hing, again, and we will count with you as well next time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And yes, I already okay. the great way you do there, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you also for all the attendees. And then uh, we see each other again tomorrow at the same time. Yeah, at one o'clock, we have another lecture tomorrow. And also for the participants in the course, you know that you had to get out of this and start other, other Zoom. Thank you very much, everybody. I will close Thank that you. now. Take care, Alex. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye.